Good morning. My name is Justin. I'm the youth pastor here at Mulder. And a few months ago, Matt asked me to preach the finale of this series on called When the Bubble Burst. And he asked me to answer uh, a question that uh, is one of the most difficult questions in the history of mankind and his existence. And that question is, why does God allow suffering or evil? Another way to, to ask that question or variation of the question could be, why do bad things happen to good people? Whenever I hear this question, I can't help but think, why do, why do good things happen to bad people, right? Because like, we know some people, like we know a few people like, man, Gary, he's a real tool. Like God's really blessed him. Like what's that about? So, so Matt asked me to address this question and he says, you have 30 minutes and we're doing communion, so maybe a little bit less than that. So let's, let's see how, how we can do it. So here goes. Um, this is a topic that, that many... Uh, many books have been written about, if not books, chapters, sermons have been preached about this, articles have been written about this question. It's a question that keeps coming up uh, because um, we either, maybe we dig into it a little bit and, and we find an answer that suits us for a while until it doesn't, or we find an answer that we don't really love, or just there's something that happened in our life on a personal level that, that it just we can't fathom. Uh, why God would have allowed something like this to happen to us. And so, um, so we always kind of wrestle with this question, and we find ourselves coming back to it for many different reasons. This is a question that many atheists and, and many unbelievers, um, it, it keeps them from, from drawing them into faith and submitting their lives to a higher power. It's just such a difficult question for them to answer. And we could spend, we could spend Sunday after Sunday talking about this issue, talking about this question, but, but here's what, how we're going to do it today. How many of you have ever flown in an airplane? You've been in an airplane? Okay, most people have. If you haven't, you'll, you'll still be able to get what I'm saying. Um, the perspective from, from when you're in the air is so much different than when you're on the ground. Like the things that you can see, the, the tops of trees, it wasn't until I was in an airplane that I learned that Target stores have like the Target bullseye on the roof. Does, it, does anyone else notice that? Like you were in the air and it's like, oh, well, that makes sense, right? Um, but the perspective is so different from the air. Okay? It, it's so different than, than when you are on the ground. And when you're in a commercial airline, you have this, this view from 30,000 feet that is so different than when your feet are planted firmly on the ground. And so the Word of God, the Word of God speaks uh, to this 30,000 foot view, okay, and on the ground level when it comes to pain and suffering. The Word of God speaks to both, okay, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about that, and if you could go with me, I sort of had, I had this picture in my mind all week, I'm not going crazy, but I sort of had this illustration that, that at the view from 30,000 feet is sort of this, this perspective that we have from the air, and then this perspective that we have on the ground, okay? This 30,000 foot, uh, foot perspective is, is this is your theology. This is what you believe about pain, about suffering, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. This is kind of the view of how you see it. And down here, this is your personal experience. This is what you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, what you feel, what you felt, your own personal tragedy, your own personal loss. And so what, what, I've, been, what I've told our previous services is what you believe here Okay, what you believe at this 30,000 foot view affects how you see things down here. Okay, one certainly affects the other. And there's sort of this tension that exists between the two because the Word of God may very well say something about our pain, about our suffering, and, and what, what the purpose in that is in our experience might be something totally different. Okay, so there's a tension here that we have to manage. And, and to be fair, there's so many areas of life where the Word of God says one thing, but our personal experience and what we want says another. Okay, so in that way, it's no different. In that way, we need to, to look at what the Word of God says and says, okay, this is, what, this is what the Bible says, this is what God says I should do, and so I'm going to try to acquiesce to, to seeing things through those lenses. And so um, we're going to talk about these two perspectives, all right, this morning. Um, but before we do, um, we have to understand that when we approach the question of why does God allow suffering, why does God allow evil, we see it through a certain set of lenses of our own. We see this as Americans living in a democratic republic in the year 2020. Okay, The people in power over us, we elect them. We have a voice. We have a say. If we like them, they get our vote. If we don't like them, they don't get our vote. Okay, and if we like them for a while and then don't like them, then we can change our vote. And we, we have power, we have a say, and we like that, don't we? Absolutely. 
Hey, we, we love that, and, and it's a great system. It's a great system because there are times that, uh, that our political leaders, they do a great job, and there are times that they don't. There are times that um, they not only do a bad job, but times that they even do very corrupt things, and, and they need to be removed. There are times that our political leaders deserve some of the blame to aim their way, and there are times that they don't deserve any of the blame. Some of you may know someone, maybe in their family, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a coworker. That, but there's the guy, and, and, and I've met the guy, who he blames the president for everything, whether it's Trump, whether it's Obama, just everything is the president's fault. If his car breaks down, president's fault. Okay? If, if sliced bread at Walmart is too high, well, you know, it's that bill that so-and-so back signed back in the day, right? Okay, if your cat dies, pre- I mean, everything is just a pre- like That guy is, is just a delight to be around, isn't he? But we, we like to blame, we like to blame someone else or something else for, for things not going right. We like to have someone to blame. But when, when we approach God in this manner, it, it begins to break down because uh, God, God doesn't need our vote. God doesn't need to be elected. Um, he is, you know, he is not, you know, just your boss at work. He is not your teacher at school. He does not, God does not need to play to his base to get reelected, all right? Um, our modern way of thinking uh, makes, makes us question God and some of the decisions that he makes. And we often find ourselves in the seat as, as a judge. Like if you can imagine a courtroom for a moment, um, that we often put ourselves in the seat of the judge and we put God at the defense table and we, we kind of have some questions for him, right? So C.S. Lewis speaks to this idea in a collection of essays called God in the Docks. Okay? And, and here's what he says. He says, the ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, okay, that's us, modern man, modern woman. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. We are the judge. God is in the dock, or God is sitting at the defense table, okay? He, man, is quite a kindly judge. We like to think of ourselves as we're, we're kind, we're fair, okay? He is a, is a quite a kindly judge, if God should have a reasonable defense for being a God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he's ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal, but the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. So again, imagine this scene for a moment where you are robed up, gavel in hand, and you are peppering the God of the universe with, with questions about some of his actions. Okay, thank you for being with us today in this hearing. Um, Yahweh, are we pronouncing that correctly? Yahweh, great. Seems like you have a lot of aliases here, but we'll go with that one. Um, can you tell us your whereabouts on September 11th, 2001? Okay, while you're at it, how familiar are you with the term Holocaust? And we, we know that you were nowhere near Germany or Austria from about 1935 to 1945. So where exactly were you? And, and I'll follow up with this question and let you answer. Um, let's just address the elephant in the room, mosquitoes, really. Like, what are we doing here? What's, what's that about? Like, you, you get the idea. I'm not trying to get on to you um, because I think we're all guilty of this. On some I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty uh, of questioning God and, and me thinking that I know better and putting myself in the seat of the judge. Okay, I'm guilty of putting myself in that place trying to determine what is good rather than God being the one who determines what is good. Okay? God is the one who establishes what is good. God is not good because I think he's good or, or I have a favorable opinion of him, but God is good because he says that he is good. Okay? Jesus himself says that no one is good but God. And so I want to I wanna show you something that, that, Paul, um, that Paul writes about regarding his own personal struggles and his own personal suffering. So um, it, it gives us sort of a shift in perspective that we need from the 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 boots-on-the-ground perspective to the 30,000-foot view. And so uh, Paul, as a qualifier, uh, Paul is a man who has seen suffering. He has experienced suffering. He uh, has experienced beatings. He's experienced verbal attacks, which we tend to downplay verbal attacks because they don't really hurt us. They don't really hurt us until they actually happen to us, and that's when they become major deals. But uh, he was mocked. He was ridiculed. This was a man constantly in prison for preaching the gospel, constantly, uh, his life was constantly threatened, um, he was often sick, had, had this ailment 
that, that he continually asked the Lord for him to, to remove. Um, a lot of people believe it had to do something with his eyes. Uh, there was even one occasion where Paul, all, in, all of this serving the Lord, you know, spreading the gospel, Paul is shipwrecked onto an island, you know, crawls onto dry land, begins to make a fire to warm himself, and then out of nowhere, a snake comes and bites him, right? It's like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously, can we get a break from this? And so Paul is, Paul is a man who has a lot of street cred when it comes to suffering. But what we see in Paul is we see this shift in perspective, again, from this is my own personal experience, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this thing and look at it from the 30,000-foot view. And so this is what he does in Romans 8. He writes this. He writes that, I consider that our present sufferings, okay, think about all the things that I just mentioned. We're, we're talking beyond the AC in your car breaking down. Even though it is Alabama and summer's coming, right? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Right? So we get, we get a hint of it right there that, that everything happening on the ground level like, let's change perspective a little bit, okay? And Paul continues, verse 19. <clears throat> for the creation waits, it waits, it waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Subjected to frustration. Life is frustrating sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes life doesn't exactly work the way we thought it would, okay? Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. In hope in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. Groaning. Different color for a reason, right? As in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So all of creation, it, it waits and it groans. And typically when we think of groaning, we are in the middle of experiencing something that we wish was over. Like we wish that we could just get out of this. Where, whatever we are, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we groan because we want it to be over. Right? So, so men, uh, when you are out shopping with your ladies, oh, right? And you just, you just see all of those dollars sort of just like float up into the air and disappear. You think you groan. You think, when will this be over? Okay, and ladies, just the same, it, when, it's, when it's Saturday in the fall and he is watching his sixth football game of the day and that one is going into overtime and there's so many things that he could have been doing, right? We, you, you groan, you, you wait, when will this be over? Goodness. Or you're going to, to see your doctor and you have a checkup and you are not looking forward to it. Um, it's an uncomfortable checkup in an uncomfortable place and you're just like, oh, when will this be over? I do not want to go and do this. So we, when, when you're in pain, we, we wait, we groan, we wonder, when will this be over? Will it ever be over? Like, will, will this ever pass? Will I ever get away from this? Will I ever stop experiencing this? Okay, not, not just you, but all of creation. All of creation, it waits and it groans for this day that pain and suffering will come to an end. That it will be eradicated. All right? And so Paul, Paul finishes in verse 28, he says this. He says that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you, if you have experienced loss, tragedy, if something has just hit you, hit your family, um, you have very likely leaned into this passage, and this passage has been uh, a, a breath of fresh air for you. It has been a lifeline to you. Um, because maybe over time you have seen, you've seen God work in it. But others of us, maybe you're not there yet. You've had someone maybe cite you this verse, and you're just like, yeah, I'm not ready to hear that yet. That might be true, but don't want to hear it today. Not interested. Okay? Um, what this passage tells us, right, what this passage tells us is that all of creation was, again, subjected to this frustration, subjected to this futility, and it all comes back to what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Because what happened in Genesis chapter 3 is that Adam and Eve made a decision to disobey God and sin entered into not just their lives, but our lives as well. Okay, it sent just a shockwave. Think of a rock hitting the middle of a lake. You see just the ripple effects go all the way to the bank. Okay, so in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve commit what theologians call original sin. That, that affected everything. 
and, and I did the math on this, and so um, there's actually 1,189 chapters in the Bible, just in case you want to quiz your neighbor on that one. And, and mankind, things are going well for two chapters of the Bible, right? Like God creates everything, God set things into order, we don't screw it up for two chapters. So the, the percentage of that is 0.17% of the way through the Bible, we're good. Like that's a horrible shooting percentage, like if that's sort of what we're comparing it to, but that's, but that's what we did. And so um, sin, the, the product of the sin, it, it affected our relationship with God and it's still affecting our relationship with God. Sin affects, affected our relationship with each other. And it still affects our relationships with each other. These are certainly not perfect, are they? Okay, sin even affected uh, our, the harmony and the peace and the relationship that we had with the earth and with the created order. Okay, not many people think about that. But in Genesis 3, it says this. It says, cursed is the ground because of you. And so when we, when we realize that there was a certain level of peace and harmony that we had with the created world and with the earth, like there's no wonder that earthquakes hit when they do, where hurricanes happen the way they do. Again, people don't always think about physical creation, us, us being, that being fractured, the relationship we have with that being fractured, but, but it's absolutely true. It's absolutely affected by sin. All of creation, all of creation was thrown into chaos, and it waits, and it groans, and it longs for the day that it can be made new, for the day that it can be redeemed, the day that it could be made whole. Original sin affected everything. And so there's, there's God is there. Um, our relationship with Him, our re- relationship with each other, even, even the relationship that we have with earth and the created order. And, and I'm, trying to, I'm trying to paint for you again this 30,000 foot view of what God's master plan is, what God is doing, and how God hopes that He can redeem all of creation. And He will. That one day He will take all of His original intention from, from Genesis, from creation, and He will make all of those things new. That He will redeem and fully restore the relationship that we had with him, that he will fully restore and and unify us as a people and the harmony that we even have with the new heavens and the new earth will be there as well. And so he does all of that in Jesus Christ. And so God is working for your good. God is working for your good, though you may not see it, though you may not feel it. And when we don't feel it, there are times that we, we want to blame God. We want to throw rocks at God. And the debate sometimes that we, we find ourselves in is either one of two choices. It's either this. It's either God is all-powerful, but not all-good, and therefore He doesn't stop evil, or He's all-good, but not all-powerful, and therefore He can't stop evil. We don't, we don't even think for a minute that we could be to blame for that. Like We've, we've got to find a way to blame God for this, because it can't be us. right? It can't be us. We, we want to pin this on God rather than the hard truth being that, that it's the sinfulness of mankind is why the world the way it is. It's why the world is the way it is. Okay, and it's our own, own sinful, it's our own selfish decisions that, that puts ourselves in a bind, that puts other people in, bind, in a bind as well. And, so, and when I say this, uh, sin is to blame. Uh, I'm not just talking about what happened in Genesis 3. I'm talking about, again, the, the shock waves that it sent through all of mankind. It affects all of us. In Romans 5, Romans 5.12 says this. It says, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay, it's like this plague that spread throughout all of us. And, and when we come to think about tragedy and, and sin and suffering, we can, we can look at two causes of that. We can say that, that part of tragedy, part of pain, part of that suffering has everything to do with living in a fallen world. Okay, that's just a fact of the matter. But the other part of that, some of the pain, some of the suffering, are the sinful decisions that we make or that others make that we have no control over. Right? And so, so it's, it's like this plague. And so this, this is our view, okay? Talking about 30,000 feet. This is what God is doing. This is the situation that we're in. I'm working to redeem it. I'm working to make all things new. And one day, all of these things will be reconciled. And so now let's, let's take it to the ground, okay? Uh, boots on the ground. Everything that we've talked about up here, everything that you, you can get right, you can, you can understand what the Word of God says, maybe you get it up here, but you're going through something right now or you've been through something, and it's not your experience at all down here. Like everything that we've talked about up here, 
really hard to see down here because something happened to you or something happened to someone that you love and, and it just doesn't make sense, right? You can, you can have just perfect theology, understand what God is doing, his master plan, all these different things. You can get it all right here, but uh, it doesn't bring that person back. And all you, all you want to do is just have one more conversation with them. It, you, you can get it all here, but it doesn't, it doesn't undo what cancer did. It doesn't, it doesn't undo uh, the divorce that you experienced. It doesn't undo the sexual assault that you experienced at the hands of someone that you trusted. You can get all the answers right here. And you think if you get all the answers, it would just fix everything. But, but it doesn't, at least not yet. At least not yet. And so we're down here and we, we wait and we groan and, and we, we have this hope. But we still, we still just kind of scratch our heads sometimes, wondering why things happen. Because it's painful. We wonder why babies are, are born with certain uh, disabilities or, or infants die at such a, such a young, precious, helpless age. We wonder why um, young children are, are hit by cars that are just accidents. Like, there are certain things that we just can't wrap our minds around and we can't make sense of. And we're, we ask ourselves the question, like, how can, how's God supposed to, to make something good of this? Is that even possible? And these are our experiences. This is the pain that we feel. We, we try to make sense of the world from this place of pain. And, and there are some things, again, that we just can't wrap our minds around. And we think that if we understood, if we just got some kind of understanding that, that it would lessen the pain somehow. That maybe, just maybe if we knew, maybe if we got some kind of insight to why, that, that it would make sense of all the chaos going around us, all the chaos going on inside of us. We, we think that we could gain some kind of self-control so that we could understand. And there's a, there's a passage in John 9, and, and Jesus, what he does is he gives us a direction to face, right? Uh, boots on the ground, living now, here we are. Jesus gives us a direction to face, and this is John 9, 1. He says, this is what, what Jesus does. <clears throat> it says, as, as he went along, Jesus, as Jesus is going along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was, it was a common belief that if you had or were born with something like blindness or, or deafness or something like that, some kind of disability, that uh, it was probably your mom that sinned or your dad that sinned or something like that. And so Jesus quickly clears this up. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And for those of you who know the story, this is the account where, where Jesus heals the blind man. He uh, hawks up a loogie, spits it in the dirt, rubs this pasty, mucusy uh, concoction on the man's eyes, and the man can see. He, he once was blind, now he can see. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend that technique, especially like cold and flu season going around, but Jesus is king, he can do whatever he wants, right? So, so this, is, this is the way that, that Jesus clears this up. Jesus did not uh, break out into a theology of pain and suffering and, and talk about, see, here's a 30,000 foot view, and he didn't have like a picture of like a plane and a person on the ground or, or a flow chart or diagram of Adam and Eve in the garden. But, but instead, Jesus says, no one's sin caused this, but, but this happened so that God might be made known and that God can be glorified in it. Because if we go back and we think about what, what is the, the pain? What's the, the cause of the pain and the suffering and the tragedy? We said part of living in a fallen world, a fallen, broken world, and the sinful decisions of ourselves and other people. Because what Jesus is saying here, Jesus is saying doesn't really matter. doesn't really matter how it happened or why it happened, but, but what can happen is that you might can do something with it. You might can make something out of it. Okay? In both cases, regardless of what it is, this can, be made, this can be used to the glory of God. And, and I love that Jesus uses the word might because it, it tells us that we have a choice in it. We have a choice whether or not we can use this for the glory of God, that we can use this to help other people. Right? There are many of you that something horrific has happened to you, something incredibly tragic. And, and over time, by the grace of God, over time, maybe years, maybe decades, you're finally at a place where you can say, 
God has, has taken my mess and turned it into a message, or God has allowed me to recycle my pain and I can use those awful experiences uh, for His good, for His glory, and to help someone else. Right? That, that you've reached a point where God is the great hero of your personal story for the pain and the suffering that He has brought you through. Pain has a way of bringing us to a crossroads where we have to decide, is, is this going to draw me closer to the Lord or is this going to repel me? Is, is this going to push me further away? But some of us, we're, we're in that place of pain now. And maybe we've been, been just wallowing in that and just suffering in that and it's been horrible and we've been in that place for, for a long time, for years, again, even decades, and we still can't see, we still can't understand how can God be glorified in this? How can God use this? Um, and we just, we just sort of push back and, and just balk at the idea that God could ever be glorified in something like that. But there are, there are things that happen that, that we have no control over. Evil exists in this world. People make uh, evil decisions every day and do very sinful things every day. Accidents happen. People are killed every single day. And even death, and we forget this, even death was not part of God's original creation. Okay, God, God once made everything that we would live forever, but death became part of the fall. Death became part of the curse. And, and there is a day where death will be no more. And so how do we, how do we reconcile the two? How do we reconcile the, the two perspectives, the, the 30,000 foot view and the boots on the ground? Um, we reconcile this in the person and work of Jesus. Because we need someone there who, who was there for all of it, right? So in, in all of creation, when, when God formed the heavens and the earth and everything that he did, Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus has this perspective. He knows the final destination. He knows what is going to happen. But he, yet he still sees all the pain. He sees all the suffering that we've experienced. He sees everything that we're going through. We've seen what's happened with all of, he's seen everything that's happened just with the fracture and all these relationships are fractured and he chooses to come down and live with us. Not as a king, not as a ruler, not as a soldier, but a very helpless, very mortal, very common baby boy. And you could argue that uh, in that day when, when Jesus was born and brought into this world, that King Herod was rounding up all the male baby boys and killing them. That seems like a strategically bad time for Jesus to come in, but he did anyways. And so Jesus lived among us, and he, he was... He, was, he suffered pain, he suffered, experienced beatings of his own, he suffered rid, you know, ridicule and, and um, rejection, loss, even experienced death. So Jesus comes down and Jesus knows that it's scary to be us. He knows what suffering is like, he knows what pain is like, he knows what tragedy looks like. And so when, when we're living life here and things don't make sense and, and we're scared for what the future holds, what Jesus does promise us is, is I'm with you. I'm with you. For, for the believer, for those who believe, for those who have put their trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit is sent and lives inside the life, and inside the heart of the believer that helps us. It helps us through that pain. It helps us through that tra tragedy. It, it helps give us a sense of hope. Because even Jesus says in John 16, he says, I've told you these things, all of these things, I've told you so that in me, in me, you may have peace right that's part of it you can't you're not going to find that peace anywhere else but in him we find that peace and in this world you will have trouble right that's a promise that Jesus makes that in this world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world I have overcome the world I have overcome uh, this pain and this tragedy that you are experiencing though you may not feel it yet though you may not experience yet there will come a time where you will experience no more, that that will no longer be part of your story. And so this is the hope that we have with our pain and suffering, that, that Jesus, Jesus, the, the God who, who sees everything, who is with us on this ground level, that, that is with us, that, that dwells inside of us, that is bringing us through each day, there's also a day that he will make all things new. Jesus tells us that I go and I prepare a place for you, that there will be no more death, there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering, depression, no more cancer. Uh, resurrected bodies will come alive. And Jesus tells us that that day will come soon. And, and until then, we, we wait, we groan, we long. We long for that day that, we, that all things will be made new, that all things will be redeemed. And so we can take our pain to Him and we can find peace in Him 
Um, even though we don't have all the answers, we can put our faith and trust in the one who does have all the answers. Amen? And so my, my hope for us today as, as we close out is that if you have not submitted that pain to him, if, if, you just, if you've been just wrestling with something, that, that you would give that to him, that you would put your trust in him, that you would find your rest in him, and that you would put your hope in him. Because the, the promises of, of hope that we have, both on the ground and at 30,000 feet, um, find, find their fulfillment in Christ alone.